Y'all, it's been a week. Not a bad week, just busy. That's all. This car, it's been through some things. In and out of the shop like three, not like it, three times in seven days in the last week. Hey, what's up, Garden Friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? I'm good. Hope you're great. Starting a vlog from the line at Starbucks. I've been sitting here for an extremely long time. I don't know the car that's up there at that window. They must have a really big order. I don't know what's going on. But thought this would be a good time to go ahead and kick things off and say hi and play a little catch up. Oh, got some movement finally. Okay, got my coffee ordered. When I turn my wheel, there's a, I shouldn't be hearing things. I don't want to take this back into the shop. Anyways, may remember, you know what? I'm gonna wait till there's something a little bit nicer to look at and be right back. Anyways, oh, things might get loud because I'm right by the private airport. That's the airport where when I'm at home and planes go flying overhead, this is, that's where they're going. Anyways, the car, remember it was like really bouncy a couple weeks ago and um, that, was really annoying so got that fixed the car has I'm not gonna try and focus because I'm driving so whatever it's pointing at is what you'll see there's a little green light in there though the car can raise and lower itself and it does that when you put a lot of weight in there in the back so like when I'm hauling gravel mulch soil rocks I mean you name it it'll adjust itself the weight pushes the car down and it lifts itself back up so there's a bag in there like a hydraulic bag something like that that popped and so the car was like sitting on top of its rods. I don't know. I don't know car stuff. So they fixed that. And then two days later, I was driving out to the sunflower maze, which you guys saw a glimpse of in the last vlog. And it was like the bumpiest, most like horrible, horrible drive I've ever had. So I was like, there's no way this is fixed. Took it back in and uh, the shocks had blown. Probably, they said it was probably from like the change in the weight or something like that. Anyways, put new shocks in, got that bag fixed, got new brakes. Goodness, I just had to pause to burp. What is in my coffee? That doesn't happen very often. And then I was at Starbucks the other day, a few days ago, and it was pouring down rain. All of the lights in my dash turned on, and the it just I the there was no control from the steering wheel from the gas brake nothing it was like the engine was running but nothing so in the rain in line at starbucks there's people behind me i had to get out of my car throw the thing in neutral push my car through the drive through i didn't stop for my drink i just kept going this is an suv i got lucky that there was an um that's where i'm going by the way that there was a, a deep, that there was a hill gosh talking's hard hold on Okay, I don't understand y'all with the backing into the parking spots. It takes so long to back into your parking spot. Are you really saving time? Yeah, I put you on blast. That's ridiculous. It might sound like I'm impatient. That's really, it's just a practical thing. I don't get it. I've, if you're really good at backing into a spot, go for it. They're still working on it. I can see it in my mirror. They're still pulling back out. Like why? Just go in head first. Maybe some people are really bad at backing out. That doesn't make any sense, though. If you're really bad at backing out, you probably should be backing into a parking spot. Anyways, that's how relatable it happened with the car. Um, on the way to the Starbucks, it was raining really hard, like I said. All of a sudden, all the lights came on down in here, and I was like, well, that's really weird. That's happened with my old car before, and it was, like, usually from, um, like, too much rain. Like, the water splashing up into things, and it would turn off on its own. That car's 23 years old, still have it, still runs great. It's a fun car to drive, just doesn't get driven very often because it needs a lot of work. This car is now 13 years old, 150,000 miles. So I was like, okay, we're starting to have problems here. What's going on? So I keep going to Starbucks. I went back and I'm going back. Okay, so here I am back at Starbucks, sitting in the drive-thru and I'm thinking, okay, with my old car, when this would happen, I would just put it in park, turn it off, wait a minute, turn it back on, and boom, problem solved. So I did that while I was in the drive-thru at Starbucks, and um, problem was not solved. So I didn't know what to do. I went into a complete and total panic because it's raining. There's cars behind me in the drive-thru. I didn't know what to do. I was like, I need a grown-up, so I called my dad. <laughs> I was like screaming. I was like, what do I do? 
which was stupid because I ended up just throwing my phone on the floor of the car and pushing it through the drive through And um, it turned out that it was just a fuse. Had to go back in the shop. I feel so dumb for not checking the fuses. Like, that's the first thing you would do. But I would turn the car on, and then, like, nothing. You The engine would turn over, but nothing. Like, you, nothing. Put my foot on the gas, nothing. Alright, I'm just going to show you what's happening. I'm going to open the door so you can hear the engine. Key in, foot on brake, turn the key. What the hell? Nothing. Nothing. So the engine's turning over. Nothing. Now, if I put my foot on the gas right away, nope, didn't work that time. I don't know. So, and it took them a while at the dealership to figure it out too, so I don't feel that dumb for not checking the fuse because they it took them a, like a day to figure that one out too. And I got the refrigerant recharged, which I talked about a few weeks ago. So the cold air is actually nice and cold now. I wasn't sure if that was going to work or not because um, I thought maybe I had just been a little bit jaded because sometimes I drive other people's cars that are newer and the air comes out really cold so I was like maybe that that's just normal that my air is not super super cold but they said no it was coming out 71 degrees so that's nice there's cold air not that I need it because I mean what the heck's that all about okay sorry that's a great view I know that that was a lot of car talk but I just I had to not that anybody cares but there's the update so I'm here at the outlet mall. I need to get my sunglasses, my lenses changed out. On these Oakleys, the lenses, you can change them. And these have gotten really scratched up over time. So uh, I need to get new ones because I'm tired of having like... And it's not going to show on camera, but they're just... They're scratched up like crazy. So new lenses, new nose piece. I'm excited because it's been a few years. So I'm going to be able to see again through my sunglasses, which is nice. I'm one of those people where I always have my sunglasses on when I'm outside, except for right now, they're in my hands, so I was just showing them to you. I intentionally did not wear shoes because I also hate backup. I never leave my house with slides on because it just feels sloppy. But this mall has so, so, so many great shoe stores. I was like, don't do it. Don't. Just wear your sandals. Don't go shoe shopping. Because I, I know some people don't care, but I would not go shoe shopping without, like, fresh shoes and socks on. Because, you know, ew. Well, that was quick and easy. That's my favorite kind of shopping. I was very helpful in there at that Oakley store. When I, there's a couple in there, and you know how sometimes people, like, you can tell they're talking loud because they want people to hear them? attention-seeking, you know? Well, they're walking out the store by me talking smack about the prices of the... I know, Oakley's very expensive, I'm aware. The thing I like about the glasses I have, though, is that the lenses have a warranty. You can snap them out, switch them out with different lenses very, very easily. I like that. That's, that's a nifty feature. Other sunglasses, you scratch up those lenses, something... Ha well, the warranty doesn't cover scratches. But, like, if the film and whatnot, the lenses start to break down, you just gotta buy new sunglasses. And for people who lose their sunglasses all the time, I get it, don't get expensive ones. I've had these for several years. I still have my first pair of sunglasses that I can remember getting, uh, which was from like seventh grade. Still have them. I've only ever lost one pair of sunglasses and it was in the lake at Disney World. I couldn't help it. They fell off my head. There's nothing I could do about it. So I like didn't even really lose those because I know where they went. I just, I couldn't get them back. So I was like, well, bye. Anyway, so the couple, they're behind me walking out of the store and they're like hundred dollar lenses i could never do that well but i'm like first of all recognize where you are you're settled between a neiman marcus a Saks fifth avenue and a michael kors store don't act like you didn't realize you're at a place that sells expensive stuff so that's stupid also this woman's carrying a uh, louis vuitton purse i'm like okay all right whatever girl but I'm, in my head, I'm like, you don't even know me. I didn't spend a dime on these lenses. They're covered by a warranty. So I've had them for two years, almost two years, and the film was starting to come off. So they're like, yeah, that's under your warranty. So the joke's on you, judgy, rude people. So that was that. And yes, I'm well aware. This is, it's a luxury. I, I, I know. I'm not trying to take that for granted. It was more of just like a 
time and place sort of thing. And I'm like, who are you? Like, look at what you're, how are you gonna walk around with a thousand dollar, multi thousand dollar, I don't know how much a Louis Vuitton purse costs, no idea. But I know that they're very expensive. <laughs> and, and my glasses help me see. I thought it was actually kind of funny. So uh, right now I am going to head to a nursery because I want to. Uh, there's a purple petunia I've been trying to get a hold of them, but I don't find anywhere, so I'm going to have my eyes out for that and any plants that are things I might be able to use, like candidates for a little water garden things. Might grab those and whatnot. Just, you know, I'm gonna poke around, see what's out there, and get home and do some gardening stuff since the first, like, seven or eight minutes of this video is me in the car and not very much at the mall. <laughs> Fun times! Oh, and then one, I do want to circle back because I want to make sure no one's like offended when I said this, I don't want to feel like a slop, walk around my slides. That's because I have two, well, both of my toenails are cracked from dropping heavy things on them. So it makes me feel like a sloppy mess. I'm not saying other people should feel that way because that's not the case. For the most part, walk around public, at least me, I don't usually like care what other people are doing or wearing. But if you're carrying a thousand dollar purse and wearing Lululemon and you want to talk some smack about how much money I spent on my glasses, then well, you might just kind of look like an idiot. I have to pee. I hope there's a bathroom here. Whoa, they're really stocked up. Everyone else is like, nope, no more tropicals, no more houseplants. Time to make room for mums. They've got a lot in here. Oh, hey cutie, how you doing? I really want a Kentia palm. I just can't find one that's the right price, you know. 200 bucks, like, that's pretty standard, but just, I don't want to spend that. Hey, I never see these for sale up here. These are the Xanthomas. Xanthosoma. I always have trouble saying it. There's the tag. Xanthosoma. This is the Lime Zinger. Really pretty, bright, vibrant foliage. And the Mayan Queen Mangaves. I love Mangaves. You, like, you guys like Mangaves? It's a cute little Apuntia. What are you? This is the baby Rita. Oh, do you turn purple? The Ritas usually turn purple. It's a 7 to 11 Monrovia, so it's, that's very, she's 70, yikes. Ooh, beautiful. I've been eyeballing this Likuwala for like a year. It's 220 bucks, which actually isn't bad for this plant, but they're not, not that easy to grow if you can't keep them outside. They like a lot of heat. It's so pretty though. I love that foliage. Hey, here's something I've been trying to find for years. Asclepius, the tuberosa. These can be harder to establish, and usually I only see them for sale in teeny tiny little pots. It's not that common to find them in bigger pots like this. It's only, like, it's really cheap too. I might grab some of these. It's great for the pollinators. Mmm, some nice looking ferns. Happy Fern Fret. Speaking of Fern Fret, I'll address why there weren't new videos this week at the end of the video. It's like, not a big deal, but I'll talk about that later. I have some beautiful perennials. I love these Japanese maples. Those beautiful, gorgeous. A steel bays. I did see some bamboo, but it wasn't the variety that I want. Is cute. Oh, acanthus. It's the oak leaf. I really like the summer beauty variety. The oak leaf seems to be the most popular this year, though. Now, there's something you don't see in St. Louis very often big standardized Natchez crepe myrtles. I mean, those things have some girth on them. I'm pretty sure those are new. I don't remember those ever being here. I've been coming to this nursery for years. Those are beautiful. If you're gonna plant, crepe myrtles this far north, even in 6B, you gotta have a girthy trunk if you want them to get through winter. The foliage will survive the winter time no problem. It just, the roots I mean, it'll die down to the ground. But um, crepe myrtles have a soft wood. So when you have a lot of freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing, that wood expands and contracts and ends up cracking and it's not great. That's why you need a nice girthy, girthy wood on your crepe myrtles if you're gonna, the further north you go, the thicker you want them to be. That's what I was trying to say. It'll be interesting to see how those do. They're situated between pavement. So there's a road on one side, a parking lot on the other. So while they're exposed, they're also getting some heat at the same time, radiating and keeping them a little bit warm. 
Maybe they'll protect them. Maybe that. Maybe those are first. I have no idea. I have a Natchez, and it grew as a woody plant for several years, and then the winters started getting really bad, and so now it dies down to the ground every year. Comes back kind of like a butterfly bush, and gets like uh, six to eight feet tall every year. Flowers, but I would prefer it be a nice tall tree. That's what the Natchez, the that crepe myrtle is known for, is being a big, beautiful tree. The bark on them is just stunning. Oh, at my favorite nursery. Why do I always do that? No music. Favorite nursery. Here at Greenscape, they have a great selection of native plants in here, which is one of the reasons I like them, because they put a lot of effort into that. Let's see, they have a whole section of natives over here and an entire house of them over here. Oh, so many pretty natives. Okay, time for a little bitty plant haul. You gonna be my helper, Toby? You are in my face. You are in my face, Toby. Oh, are you tired? Are you sleepy, Toby? Yeah, okay. Sorry for getting distracted there. It's like, he's, he is in my face. Anyways, mostly natives here. Not completely. I grabbed this prairie duck here, which I planted some of these last year, and they didn't make it through the winter, which is very, very unusual. But I thought I'd give them another go. The ones I got last year weren't rooted into their pots very well, so I'm hoping that it should do better this time. Prairie Dock gets, I mean, you can see these leaves on here. They get really big paddle-like foliage on them. It gets really, really big, and then they shoot up a great big flower spike, like tall, like six, seven feet tall. Let's look at the tag together. It says three to six feet tall there, but... There's a park I go to around here where these are, it's just like natural prairie all around the pathways. And I swear those flowers are way above my head, but I guess I could be mistaken. I don't know, but really awesome plant. You can see the flowers on there look kind of like tiny little sunflowers. They're adorable. So there's the prairie dock. And then over here, I think this is a type of helianthus, right? It's an oxeye sunflower. So it's a heliopsis, helianthus. These also get very large. It says 30 to 46 inches wide and 36 to 60 inches tall. And I grabbed one that has a flower on it just for like a frame of reference. They get lots and lots of these flowers on them. So that will also be a nice tall yellow flower. There's a lot of yellow flowers here for someone who used to talk about not liking yellow flowers, right? Because this one also, another one with the yellow flowers. And again, shoots up really big tall spikes, 48 to 72 inches tall of these pretty yellow flowers. So it's all for the butterflies and hummingbirds and bees. That's the whole purpose behind all of those. And the same thing with the Asclepius, the butterfly weed. Are you gonna, you gonna stand in front of everything? Is that what's going on here? We're just, we're just that's a, I don't like the way your nose is moving. It looks weird, Toby. Anyways, I uh, talked about these at the nursery. These are the Asclepius tuberosa. There's its tag. The flowers are typically either yellow or orange. Two I got look like they have yellow flowers on them. I would prefer the orange, but um, I did find one at another nursery. At the last nursery, it looks like they had orange flowers. There's its tag. Like I mentioned with these before, they don't always transplant well. They're not a plant that likes to have their roots disturbed. So being able to find them in these bigger pots is really nice because any other time I've planted them, they've been in itty bitty tiny little pots and it just like, there wasn't enough to it to get them going and getting them through the heat of their first summer. I did have some come back, but there's still just like one, just, just like one. <laughs> it's just like one little string coming up, which is fine. It'll establish itself in a few years, but these are further along. And this one right here is the one that I got from the other nursery. It's the same thing. It's an Asclepius tuberosa, but it does appear to probably have had orange flowers. It's a little bit harder to tell, but in comparison between the two, this one looks more orange than yellow to me. And I really do prefer the tuberosa with the orange flowers on them. All of these plants, oh wait, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I still have these over here. Manfreda virginica. These are really cool plants. It's the agave or the false ala, aloe. Almost, why was I saying it weird? They look like an agave or an aloe, but they are deciduous, kind of like a mangave. It's another native. You don't see them that often. I don't see them that often anyways. I, when I do see them, they're usually much bigger than four to six inches, but that's okay. 
So they have a nice rosette shape to them. This one's kind of lacking a little bit on this end. This one over here, I did get two of them because it's not something I see for sale very often. These Mangaves are hardy only into zone seven and eight and higher. These are hardy, I think, all the way to zone five. Well, it doesn't say on the tag, so I'm not positive. And these flower, they set up a flower spike every year. Another difference between this and an agave. An agave, they take longer to flower, and when they do, that's it for the rest of the plant. These, they die back in winter, but they'll keep doing that. And so everything I've gotten here, all the prairie dock and the heliotropes and Asclepius, everything are dry loving plants. They're plants that like things a little bit more arid. So I'm gonna have to do some rerouting with my drips, but that's no big deal. I'll just, you know, make sure they're not getting hit with the sprinklers for the most part. And that should be pretty easy. Typically, this is a rough time of year to be planting things, but I don't think that's going to be an issue because I, I think I mentioned this earlier. If we're like, we've had a very cool summer. We had a week where it was really hot which was not great for a lot of plants because it had been really cool and rainy and then it was just like, okay, it's gonna be like 100 degrees for a few days. And that was shocking to a lot of, mostly like petunias, they didn't appreciate that. Otherwise everything's okay. So like what I was gonna say, or trying to say is that typically not the best time of year to be planting, but usually depending on the plant, if you do it really early in the morning and it's not something that needs full sun and it depends on the plant, I think these are going to be fine with temperatures being in the mid 80s. That's not a big deal. I don't usually worry about the heat of the summer with most plants, not all, until like pushing 95 and up, especially if it's a spot that gets full sun. These will be in a spot where it's not full sun. It would be ideal if it was because these are all plants that really prefer full sun. But there's a big hibiscus over there that I guess I could just show you. I just have to get up. Yeah, so back here, this is the dump garden where I just kind of throw things that I want to grow but don't necessarily fit in anywhere else, low maintenance type plants. You can see there's some hydrangeas back here that used to be in other places in the garden that weren't getting enough sun so I threw them over here and then a great big hibiscus and if that hibiscus is doing well then all those other things should be doing just fine. The hydrangeas are on drip which makes a really big difference when they're getting a lot of sun and then this is where I've been spreading old soil and stuff like that and I need to regrade that and pick out some weeds. I don't, it's not an area I fuss with very much. I do tend to kind of let the natives do their thing. And that right there, right above my finger, that's the teeny tiny little bitty bit of Asclepius that came back from last year. Nothing very significant, but getting that area re-spread out and I can put the drip individually on the plants that like the water and then let the rest of the place be arid. Because most of the things I'll be putting up there are like prairie type plants. Where I live in St. Louis, it's kind of where the prairie sort of ends and the foothills begin. So there's a lot of mixture with the natives. But I'm going with the ones that like the dry because it's just, it's easier. And um, the Asclepius, specifically because of the monarchs. They need the Asclepius, the milkweed. It's, what, it's their host plant. I had thought about maybe getting some sweet spire, but that's like a much larger bush. But they're a host plant to one of the swallowtails. Really pretty, beautiful type of butterfly and their caterpillars are really cool too but I didn't just because it's like a larger shrub and I wanted to make sure that that was situated a little bit more appropriately and there was something else I got oh yeah philodendron uh this was labeled as moonlight at the store and I can see that it looks like a moonlight very cute very pretty gorgeous I love these guys and then I got a new prince of orange philodendron I had one of these for years and then the mealybugs got a hold of one of them and it didn't kill the plant but I just was like I had had enough of the mealybugs at the time and I was like you gotta go I got rid of the plant so which I regretted as soon as I did it it was just like if you've been around the channel for a while last winter was trying for my patients to say the least when it comes to those mealybugs and everything but at that problem's almost resolved now I don't want to jinx it and, uh, but like I said, I regretted throwing that away because I'd had it for years and I loved it. And this was pretty darn cheap. So I got it. So I was like, I regretted getting rid of that one as soon as it happened. So it's very pretty. I like the Prince of Orange a lot. It's a really cute, happy philodendron. And I also grabbed one of the acanthus while I was there because I wanted a new one. I've wanted one of the newer acanthus for a while. Sorry about the fan. Fan's been noisy and I've been repotting. So the repotting stuff's all still over there. And that's all fun, but I'm trying to not show you guys too much. There's a garden tour coming up in a couple videos. And I've been busy doing some stuff, so I have to be careful where I point the camera. But if you've been around the channel for a few months, you're going to realize why I'm excited about what I'm about to show you. Look at that. Skip laurels. Finally. This is what I had been planning on putting on the back of this berm here. 
to make a privacy hedge. I grabbed three of them. Price was fantastic. I need five or six of them, but you know, beggars can't be choosers, right? So I got what I could afford. And this is, it's a starting point. But yeah, those are gonna go on this berm back here. And so you get, I think four to six feet tall, four to six feet wide. So they're not gonna get quite as tall as I would like for something to get for the privacy, but they're definitely at least gonna provide the privacy screening. Which is fantastic. And just having some evergreen interest out here in the wintertime will be really nice. I like the laurels. They're such pretty plants. They have a nice shape to them. They can go sun or shade. This is very, very, very shady over here. If it weren't, there are like tons of other options I could put back there that would be better. But then there's its tag, the Skipensis cherry laurel. Really pretty, nice evergreen shrubs. I like them a lot. And I almost forgot, I did grab this tiny little stromanthi. They had big ones for $29.95, which is a good deal, but in the past I haven't had the best luck overwintering these. Now, I haven't really tried since I've redone my grow space and things are a lot more warm in the wintertime, but I just, I didn't want to go big. So I got this little guy. I have a couple others. I'm actually probably going to do these in here with this cordelin right here, which I'll talk about that at the end of the video, but yeah. I got that, and then I got some cute little pots, too. Aren't they cute? They're just little teeny tiny clay pots. No holes in the bottoms. So they need to be drilled and whatnot. I don't know why. I was just really drawn to these. Like, I want to put a teeny tiny itty bitty little tree in them. Wouldn't that be cute? And just kind of a way. It was waste. It was an impulse buy. Shouldn't have gotten those. Everything else I need. No, I need it. Don't worry about it. I got some stuff to plant. Yeah, I need my biotone. I've been trying to get this pot glued back together but I ran out of Gorilla Glue, so that was a big waste of time. And sidetracking, I don't know why when I was talking about the these um, Minfredas here, why I was saying that they're similar to an Allo. What's an Allo? It's aloe, what is that? Sometimes when you're talking to a camera, it's just, it, you, it's hard to speak. Case in point, that was not well phrased at all. I don't think the drips are working on this guy. I need to do something about that. You can see these petunias are looking kind of thirsty. Like extremely thirsty. Now I've got my hole dug for the laurels. I'm gonna add some gypsum because this berm was like mostly clay. I've built up the soil a lot over the years. So once you dig down about a foot, maybe 14, 16 inches, it turns into clay. So I need to put the gypsum in the bottom of the hole to help break that up and then the, you know the drill. So up here, here's my little hole I've been working on. Just gonna do a scattering of the gypsum and I'm going to work it up here into the soil that I'm going to be backfilling with also. That's going to help break things down. There's calcium in there. It's good for the roots and whatnot. I cannot get the dang sticker off the shovel. Very annoying. And then I'm only going to put a teeny tiny bit of the biotone starter in the bottom of the hole. It makes more sense to have it kind of near the root zone as I get that in there. Uh, it's a tight work area here. <laughs> things are getting kind of crammed. These pedicets grew so well this year because it's been so cool and rainy which is that's their jam that's what they like I mean they've just giant the snail stuff isn't really working that well over here either maybe I need to like double the amount I'm putting down I'm not sure but we've kind of reached a place where it's not raining anywhere near as much so that should start to help with that also so when it's raining constantly you can throw that stuff down but eventually still it's gonna wash away and break down the snails won't even get to it Okay, so I've got one of the men. This is, the problem is this is as close as I can get to the berm from straight ahead. This isn't working. Okay, I moved everything out of the way. What I was going to say is I was spending a long time on the other side of the patio trying to decide where to line these shrubs up. Then I remembered that if I'm gonna end up doing this as a hedge, it doesn't really matter. Spacing matters, four to six feet wide, so need to stay within, I want it to be a tight hedge, so probably 18 inches across because they're already about 30 inches so somewhere in there and then I'll probably want I don't know I'll just do it man there's a lot of mosquitoes over here and I had also gotten some ostrich well I'll talk about that when I'm done I don't need to do that now okay so I know it's hard to see and the zoom on this camera just sucks but what I was trying to say before is that I was trying to decide if I should go one two three or go one two three so I went and put the other one in there so I could like get an idea and I'm thinking I should go with another one right there and then wait to get the other one spread. Because I can put a majesty palm on 
I have extra majesty palms. I can fill in the gaps with those for now. I think that's what I'll do. We'll give it a second and see how it looks. <laughs> I said give it a second. It's taking me like 25 minutes to dig these holes. It is such compacted clay over here and there's a lot of gravel mixed in. The first hole I dug, no problem. The others, they're not behaving anywhere near as much. Oh, I love it. I know it's just shrubs, so it doesn't seem like a big deal, but guys, this berm has been a thorn in my side for years because it used to be beautiful, full of crepe myrtles. Then the trees grew and crepe myrtles weren't doing well anymore. And then I put bananas in here because they were able to stretch for the light, and that looked fantastic for a few years. Had a great big, like, 10 foot wall. Bennett. And then the trees grew, and those didn't. It's just been a headache trying to figure out what to put here for privacy. And uh, perennials, you know, getting annuals and things like that, I get them on clearance a lot, so that helps cut costs, but does it really since they don't come back every year? Having something evergreen makes me so happy. Now, hold on, I'm standing on top of the diving board. This one right here, it needed to go about like six inches this way, but there's a pipe in the ground, so it's planted a little bit close to the other. I don't care, it's gonna be a hedge. And uh, I planted them so that they follow, it's hard to see because of all the soil whenever, like I had to pull all the stuff off the berm, but this all has a curve to it. So I actually placed them to the curve instead of having a straight line because the berm isn't in a straight line. So uh, with the other two or three that I end up putting down here, I will have, let's see, where does it goes? So the other two, one will come back there and then the other one will come forward a little bit. It'll look fine like that. I don't know if I need three more or not. I think just doing one more right here, then one more kind of right where that little micro irrigation head is would be just fine. I would like to take it down further. It's not fully necessary, especially because the sizes on these skip laurels are all over the place. The tag says four to six feet by four to six feet. Generally, I usually see them like in people's gardens and botanicals and whatnot. Sorry, I just got really distracted because I just noticed that my oak tree is full of dead limbs. That's not great. Another tree to take care of. I don't know. Hopefully, I think that's probably just an age thing, because I don't see any bare spots up in it any further. Anyways, I'll handle that with the rest of the tree trimming that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. But what I was saying is the sizes are all over the place for these guys. If they do get 4 by 6 that's fine. It'll do. I would prefer something more on the 10 to 12 foot height-wise. And some sites say that they get 10 to 12 feet. There's one that says 18, one that says 30, which I think that's a stretch. Probably they're probably writing about a different type of laurel and just mess the name up would be my guess. I'm expecting about eight foot, somewhere in there. They're in the shade, they'll get bright morning sun and then filtered. You can see, you know, they're getting filtered light right now. At least one of them is, the one or two of them are. The one furthest to the right, not so much. And that's fine for these in hot climates. They can take a lot more shade and cool climates, like maybe the Pacific Northwest, they can go with a lot more sun and there's going to be size variables with those climates too. Like if you, where I live, you plant a, like just a typical evergreen rhododendron, maybe they'll get three and a half, four and a half feet tall at like the max. I rarely see them any larger than that. But if you go up to like Seattle, <laughs> those same rhododendrons can be gigantic, you know, eight to 10 foot tall bushes. Absolutely stunning. So climate probably has a lot to do with the size variables is what I'm thinking. Either way, they work here. They're beautiful. They make me very happy. I, much as I love the pedicets, which they, I had to trample through them a little bit because there was also a large hydrangea, which is now right there <laughs> on the left side of the screen, that needed to be moved because there's not enough sun over there for it anymore. So I'm going to move that somewhere that's more sunny and it will bloom. It hasn't bloomed in years because it's so shady over here. Does anybody remember what I was talking about? Oh, the pedicets. I love them. I talk about them like almost every vlog, I feel like. I do kind of wish they were doing their thing on the other side of the berm though, because there's like almost a formal, nice looking thing going on there, and then that's happening. They looked better before I trampled through them. They'll bounce back, I'm not too worried about that. I still love them, I'm not gonna dig them up or move them. I'm gonna let them do their thing. But that brings me to my next point. I started talking about my ostrich ferns earlier. Now back in May, I wanna say, I picked up a bunch of ostrich ferns. The uh, It's called the King is the variety. Let me go grab some. Yeah, here they are. I have them laid out on this table over here. Now, ostrich ferns generally get about two feet tall. The king variety is supposed to get like three to five feet tall. And the plan with these, 
was to have them kind of in the middle of the berm in front of the laurels. That's why I got them. But these things, the pedicets grew so incredibly well that I don't really think these are going to fit there anymore. Maybe these are heavy spreaders too. So wherever they go, they'll kind of go wherever they want to and fill in the area. Over time, they'll fill in the entire berm, which is also now happening with these, which I didn't think would happen, but it is. But since these are taller, I just don't want things to get too crowded in there. I don't have anywhere else to put them though. That was the entire plan. And it was before these, like I said, before these took off. So I'm thinking maybe I'll just kind of tuck them in to some spots over here and let them just do their thing and see what happens. And here, before I go ahead and plant this, look at, see how aggressively these run? There are a lot of plants in here. They're very easy to divide. I'm probably gonna do a Fern Friday on these, so I don't wanna go too in depth here, but I'll probably be reusing this footage. So it's very easy, just make cuts in here. These have been in a very damp area, so there are some snails and find some millipedes and whatnot, but you can just take a clean knife, divide them. It's real easy to do. I'm not going to do that. I don't think it's necessary right now. I want them to just kind of chill out. Oh, pretty, I love ferns. All right, so I still have two ostrich ferns left, which is fine because I haven't gotten all the laurels planted yet. Need to go ahead and water everything in. And this is, what is it, a couple ounces per gallon? What's it say on there? One dose is 20 milliliters. I'm gonna be putting this in a 45 gallon. I have to do math, be right back. Okay, so, three and a half cups. That's, that's an awful lot, but I'm mixing an awful lot. I need, okay, well, so uh, just one bottle. That's fine, that's close enough. It's my little fertilizer barrel. For those of you who've wondered why there's a trash can on my patio sometimes, this is what I use for bulk fertilizing more often than not. I don't always, but I've just found I can measure things out a little bit more easily, hook it up to a pump, and just makes things easier. Because for me, <laughs> this is much easier than having to mix up multiple just like with watering cans. No, don't have time for that. This works just fine. They make um, like actual dosers you can use. That'll help distribute your fertilizer properly, but those cost an absolute fortune. So this works fine. Gonna give everything a heavy soak and I also I have a couple other areas I need to give this to and, and be done with this area. Oh, I did, I got the other ferns in. It's not much to see yet. Someday, it'll be pretty. It'll be really pretty. Great big like chartreuse green foliage up in front of the dark green of the laurels. Oh, it's gonna be so pretty. Someday, not yet. Things are just getting started over here. This stuff smells so bad. I mean, it's made out of manure, so no surprise there. Like, y'all been to the zoo when you get near, like, the, um, where they keep the primates? The, that's what, that's what I smell like now, so I'm gonna go take a shower. Eh, well, actually, I have a whole nother area I need to plant up, so I'll just rinse off for now. I have a quick pet break before I move on to the other projects that I have to zoom through fairly quickly. Hi, Plunkin. Say hi to everybody. Yeah. Oh, you're gonna act like you don't want to be pet when you were just meowing at me to pet you. What's going <laughs> What is this? What's happening? What's happening? You got itchies? <laughs> you can't make up your mind? Too much is happening. Now she's gonna act like I was bugging her. She was just like begging for attention before I hit record. It's got some itchies in her eye. Poor baby girl. You're so sweet looking. I'll leave you alone, clearly. You're not in the mood to be bothered right now. Take a kiss. Thanks, pumpkin. A busy day, Toby. Busy being a Toby rug. Toby. Hi, Toby. Toby. Yeah, acknowledge me. Thanks, Toby. Good boy. Well, good boy. Where's Tucker? Is Tucker sleeping? We'll, we'll catch up with him later. Can I help you? Making lots of noise. Say hi. Get a kiss? No? Okay, you give a kiss? Yeah, pretty bird. Okay, back to work. All right, so now what I have to do is go through the perennials and some annuals that I have that I was going to put over into my pollinator garden and kind of get them situated. I don't think they're gonna get planted in this video. I'm running out of light and I gotta get this video edited and the area they're going in, which is the area I showed earlier that I refer to as my dump garden, 
uh, it's very difficult to dig over there. Like, really, really hard because it's just, like, gravel. So it takes a very, very, very long time, even for teeny tiny little plants. But um, it'll be done for the garden tour that should hopefully be out this upcoming week, a few videos from now. So that's, that's the goal anyways. Can't predict the future, but we'll see. So the Nepeta, this is a cat's meow, is the variety. And it has, which you can't see, some cute little purple flowers on it. Pollinators love them. I have three of those. And then in here, this is, pull the tag out so everybody can see it, the Gisophila panicula. This variety, I think, gets 12 to, okay, 12 to 18 inches, not huge. Hardy zones three to five. What else do I have? I have a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to take over there. Um, I have a lavender that's tucked behind there. Yeah, maybe I'll just set them up and we can talk about them then. Oh, the obedient plant. It's the Crystal Peak obedient plant. These can be used in water gardens. So this is one I've been debating what I'm going to do with. I haven't decided if I'm going to put it in a planter in the pond that I would be making quotes right now if my hands weren't full, you know, the little pool pond thing, or if I'm going to put that back into the garden. They like a lot of water, <laughs> hence being able to put them into the pond, into an aquatic planter. And the majority of things I'm planting, like I talked about earlier with the Asclepius, are going to be more dry loving plants, things that don't like wet feet, like the Monardos. I need to get those planted too. They're going to need a big cutback. Okay, well, there's at least the beginning of the process. Everything is sitting right next to where they're going to be planted, so that they will be spaced further apart than this. They'll be spaced appropriately. The natives, these guys down here from the hall earlier, they'll be in the back because they get very, very tall. just won't show for a couple of years. And a lot of these things need cutbacks because a lot more clearance plants and whatnot. But, you know, I mean, it was called a dump garden before, so not like it's going to be a dramatic before and after. But I will step through that in more detail during that garden tour. Quick update on the water lilies. They haven't done much. It's only been a week. They're still natural dying off happening from having been shipped and whatnot. But at the same time, they're also putting up lots of new pads, which is great. Same thing with the Siam Sunset. This one, if you recall when I planted this, it had like no roots on it, which is kind of annoying for how much it costs. It could have had some more roots to it. But uh, it's also just a variety that doesn't really form much of a tuber. So it can be a little bit harder to anchor it down. So because of that, it has floated up a few times. So every time that happens, it's a bit of a setback. I have put some string across the top to help just kind of gently hold it down. And that's why I ended up, I was going to, the original plan this week was to do like an entire water garden thing. But I was like, no, these lilies really need to establish themselves for at least probably three weeks before I get going with that. But, um... If there's questions or anything, just let me know and we can talk about it in the comments for people who want to get jump started on projects like this. Happy to help out. Okay, now, why I didn't upload this week. It's because of this one right here, the Cordelin Fruticosa Singapore Twist. <laughs> I did a video on the Cordelins and it just, it, there were so many, I would say, issues, but instead we'll call them learning opportunities <laughs> with editing that video that I just didn't have time to get anything else out. And by the time I finished editing this video, I was like, okay, well, there's no point in even up. I'm going to wait till next week to even let this one out. So that's what that's about. It was just one thing after another. It was partially because I didn't realize until this video, and this has gone on in a few videos, I didn't even realize it, that when I film things in slow motion on my camera, it will only do it in 1080p. Now, I film the weekly videos in 4K. That presents a problem when it comes to things looking nice. I had looked at some of my other videos, I'm like, how come these slow motion shots are coming out kind of blurry and choppy once they're exported? And then I was messing with my camera and realized, oh, well there's a difference in resolution there. So basically there's lots of mixing, mixing. There's a lot of missing pixels when I incorporate a slow-mo shot into the 4K. Now, I don't have to film in 4K. The reason I, I did it one time, I liked how it came out. because The main thing I noticed was that my camera focuses very well when I'm shooting in 4K. It's like, oh, you mean business. We're really doing something here. When I'm just filming in 1080, sometimes I will spend a long time just trying to get a single little shot because the dang lens is just not doing what it's supposed to, which is very frustrating because it's a nice lens, but 
sometimes it just doesn't doesn't want to behave. And a lot of that's to do with lighting and stuff like that. You know, there's a certain time of day you have to be out here to get those videos done. And I enjoy making them and I enjoy editing them. But this one just kind of put me through the ringer as far as just like issues after issues after issues. Because that's just like one of many things. For one, for some reason, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know why. But I didn't even realize it until I sat down to edit the video that the entire time I was referring to this plant as a Thai plant. That's not, it's pronounced tea plant, not type. So I, I had to go through and fix as much of that as I could. There were certain spots where I couldn't really do anything about it. I was just like, oh well, I'm human, it's fine. But it was, like I said, just <laughs> it's a very frustrating video. I enjoyed making it, but it uh, made it pretty much impossible to have the time to get anything else done for the channel last week. So I'm sorry about that. Just, you know, sometimes life throws things at you, and I learned a lot in the process. The software had done some updates, and there were some changes, like inserting text. You just used to hit T on the keyboard, now it's Control T. Although, I worked on the vlog last night, and it went back to just being T, so I don't know what that's all about. But it's a, it's a process, and it's fine. <laughs> but uh, this plant right here, the Singapore Twist... I am absolutely in love with this plant. I know it probably doesn't look like anything special, but to me it just reminds me so much of like a traveler's palm mixed in with a screw pine, blended in with the cordolin, you know, the fruticosa, because what it is, it's a cordolin fruticosa, because they fan out so neat like this, and then as they get taller they twist and spiral. Such a neat variety, and I was really happy to get it, because it was in a vlog, I don't know, a few weeks ago, and... Uh, I just like glimpsed at it in the vlog, but as soon as I left that nursery, I'd been thinking about this plant ever since. It was pricey, so I was like, I'm not going to spend that kind of money on a tropical. And uh, I did more research on the variety on the Singapore twist. I'm like, okay, well, it's not very common. So I was like trying to justify the cost, and I never did. I never did justify the cost. I was like, absolutely not. But then I found out that these things were on sale. <laughs> You know, because a lot of places are clearancing out their tropicals to fill in with mums and kale and cabbage. And I'm, that, that's a whole other thing I don't feel like talking about right now. But I'm happy to have gotten this plant. Got a great deal on it. So that's, that's, it was, it all started with this one though. And I had thought about just like throwing together some quick planters and things like that. But it just, I had a little bit of creativity block. And I was like, no, I really need to focus on getting the perennials in the ground. Like I can't even think about the planters right now. So that's kind of why I worked on that this week. You know, getting this done, even though you know, it may not look fantastic to a lot of people, this is a very big deal to me to have finally gotten this done or started because I still need to get a few more to put down here. The whole area needs to be mulched and everything. I didn't see a reason to bother with that right now because one, it's not going to be super hot, so I'm not worried about holding in the moisture or anything too much. And then I'm going to it's, it's gonna be making a big old mess here when I grab the other ones in a few weeks. And I know these are way too close together, I know, but I just, there was no other spot. Like, I put my shovel down a few other places over there, and it just wasn't happening. So, yeah, with hedges, it is good to you know, put them a little bit closer together than suggested, but, like, this is a bit much, but it'll be fine. I'm not really that concerned about it. Now, appearance-wise, it bothers me because this one's further than that one, but I just, I'm not, I'm just happy that it started. It's very exciting to me. I had posted on my Instagram something about, I, I, there's a fertilizer that I do. It's not something I'm going to make a big deal out of when I talk about it in a video. It's going to be in this video. I actually had started the vlog talking about it where I use, it's an old, old, old recipe. I don't remember where it came from, but it's like beer, Epsom salt, water. It calls for ammonia. I tend to usually skip that and use like a seaweed fertilizer at like half the rate. It's, it's a whole big thing. Just one of these things when you're doing things online, it's, sometimes it feels like you can't so much as sneeze without having people come for you. So it's just like, I debated whether or not to share that fertilizer thing I've been doing for the entire time I've been gardening. So with things like that where I'm like, I know there are going to be people who have opinions about this and why I'm like, I don't know if I even feel like talking about it. Which brings something up that I, I don't know if I want to talk about. I do want to talk about it, but I don't. <laughs> it has to do with honeybees and bees in general. And oh man, I just spent a long time, like a really long time in this video. I'm talking like a solid 18 minutes 
talking about stuff that I'm just going to delete out of this. Basically, in a nutshell, I'm wondering what people's opinions are when it comes to veganism and honey. Because I'm not even going to go into it. That's it. Just veganism and honey. There's problems with the honeybee populations, and I want to know your guys' thoughts on that. So that is all. I don't need to put my opinion out there yet. I'm going to wait. Doesn't need to be some long, drawn-out, dramatic discussion. My goodness, I just went on and on and on, and then it turned into some political things. Y'all are here for a good time. I don't want to poop on your rainbow. So uh, sometimes I feel like I like maybe need to make another channel just for talking about other things that are going on and that maybe people would consider controversial, even though I don't consider them to be. Uh, I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on that, because you know people are here and they want to see plants and stuff. For the most part, I try and do that in the vlogs, but sometimes I just, I need to talk. I want to talk. And it can be tricky sometimes to just be like, yeah, everything's great, everything's okay, when we all know what's going on in the world and everything's not okay. And, you know, fellow empaths, raise your hands. Like, you know what I'm talking about. It can be a struggle. But um, I do want to keep things whiter, so... It's not necessary to go into any of those things over here. I'm, like I said, I'm considering maybe setting up a different channel for things like that, where it's just like um, conversations and connecting, and it's not necessarily with the basis of gardening. Even though this is a gardening channel, the vlogs kind of go whatever direction they go. <laughs> but, but I want it to be a good time. But yeah, what do you guys think? Let me know. Keep it respectful. It's conversations, they need to be respectful, both directions. It's important in order for people to fully hear what's being said and to take it in and process it. And I think my apprehension with even talking about this is one of the th other reasons I didn't upload this week, to be honest. It was just one of those things where I was like, I think I need to just take a step back from the internet, from social media, because there was just a little thorn in my side that was brewing because it's... Sometimes if you can't talk about something, if you can't have a conversation, then how do people learn and grow together from it? I don't understand that. It's so it's the jumping down people's throat and the just being so quick to attack when it's not necessary. It doesn't really do a lot of good because once you attack, people stop listening. You know, that's 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 how I feel about it anyways. My goodness, this is so pretty. I love these alakajas so much. Uh, I have been seeing a ton of butterflies, particularly monarchs, which makes me very, very happy. There's lots of different types of Asclepius planted out here for them, which is fantastic. And there have been a lot of really big swallowtails feed on the lantana. They seem to be enjoying it. This is, I was going to do a big prune back on this, but it just, it keeps flowering and it's, the pollinators are so drawn to it. I'm like, you know, they can, y'all, you just, you take it. It's fine. It doesn't need to look pretty. Y'all enjoy it. Get your dinner. All right, now that I've fully shot myself in the foot, I'm going to be totally regretting even bringing that up. Hope everybody's doing well. <laughs> I'm mostly joking. People are generally very respectful on this channel. So that's, I mean, that's something I try and remind myself of and need to remember that when it's, sometimes things can be a sensitive topic. It shouldn't be a sensitive topic, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah moving on. Life's just too short, right? We all need to learn and grow together. Uh, this is, see how, what happens when the, I lose my light? Look at that. What's going on with my lighting? That's terrible. But okay, next week there will be more planting, a lot of container stuff going on. There will be a garden tour, hopefully in a few days. And that, that's pretty much it. It's just life is normal around here. It's mostly just computer stuff that kept me from getting things uploaded. So again, sorry about that. And this is where one of the things when I say, hey, don't forget to leave the video a thumbs up. Helps the channel a lot. I appreciate it. Subscribe as well and hit that notification bell. That way you know new videos come out because I upload multiple times a week. I swear, I usually do. I usually do upload multiple times a week. This doesn't happen very often. I didn't enjoy not having uploaded. That wasn't fun. There's more pot consolidation going on. That's why there's still messes. It's going to be a busy couple of weeks. I also have this goldenrod over here that I forgot to talk about, but I think I'm going to use this in a planter. But the pollinators really like this. See, nothing focuses when you start to lose your light. I'm, I'm just, but yet I'm still talking. There's actually a bunch more plants that I need to get down that I, I have and are ready to be planted, like some Russian sage, some more different types of helianthus, and lots of fun stuff. Suggest in the comments down below things that you notice your honeybees flocking to for those of you who are seeing them around. That'd be useful to absolutely everybody, and I appreciate that. 
My social media is linked down below. It's a good place to get a hold of me for like the rare occasion when I do go a week without uploading. Then I'm probably over there on Instagram. It's time to shut up now. Cicadas are chirping. We all got stuff to do. But like I said, I do hope everybody's doing well, having a great day, great laugh. Everything's just going wonderfully for you. And as always, and most importantly, everybody, would you focus? <laughs> Keep on growing. Bye bye.